All right, welcome back to our third module in the series, an introduction to ELLs and WIDA. In this topic, we're going to talk about differentiation. What is it? What does it look like in our classrooms? And most importantly, why should we differentiate? Isn't differentiation just dumbing things down for students that don't understand the first time? So as we look into this topic of differentiation, I think it's a very apt description to use the following uh, cartoon to make you think a bit about this idea. So to engage our minds in this idea of differentiation, what are some of the things that we see in this cartoon? Well, there's a lineup of animals of various and sundry sorts and a teacher behind his desk clearly saying, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And obviously the monkey's going to do quite well, top of the class. The bird, he could fly up there. I wonder if the teacher will consider that cheating or if he'll have to climb as well. And then I'm guessing that the fish and the seal, maybe the elephant, is going to have the hardest time climbing up that tree. Penguin, of course, too. Much of a tricky time. And I even wonder if the dog even speaks English to understand the question itself. So this silly cartoon represents a couple of things. For me, one thing I see here is that every student is built differently, and we need to understand the way they're built in order to help them to succeed in our classes. Another thing I see here is that the teacher maybe just doesn't have the understanding of what it means to really give instruction or give assessments that are actually meaningful and helpful for a student as they develop. Because why does a fish even need to climb a tree? And on this topic, using this cartoon as an example, the last thing I'd like to mention to you now is that the fact that court cases have decided in the past 50 years that an identical education for English language learners is not the same thing as an equal education. Just like separate is not equal, identical is certainly not equal. So, the WIDA Consortium defines the word differentiate to mean to modify the presentation of the content, process, product, and or learning environment based on readiness levels, interests, and learning profiles to provide success and challenge for all students. So you'll notice that there are several things in bold that we are modifying. It's the presentation of our content, how we actually deliver it to the students, the process of how we organize it, and then the product of what we expect from the student, and then also the learning environment, the kind of things we set up in order to make this a meaningful experience for students. And we want to base it on many different things as well. How ready are they to understand the language and produce the language? What kind of interest do they have that might play in from a cultural or linguistic perspective? And based on a learning profile of understanding the student, how can we really make this the most successful and challenging experience for them? If you actually think about it, there's probably many times that you in the real world have been differentiated for. So take a second to consider, perhaps in, the, in a doctor's office or a mechanic shop, if you didn't understand uh, all the different parts and how it was going to fix, how it was going to get fixed, did your mechanic simplify things for you? Or perhaps in stores and restaurants, do you need to use wheelchair accessible ramps or things like that? Perhaps in a lesson you took once, uh, a music lesson, a sports lesson, a dance lesson, did someone bring things down to your level in order to teach you and reach you? Many people are differentiated for on airplanes, the kind of food you select or the area of the plane you sit at. And when you travel in other countries, did people make differentiations for you as you were making your way in a place where you didn't know, understand the language? Or maybe even an academic setting. Some of our teachers are second language learners themselves, and when they take the praxis, they actually are allowed to have an extra bit of time to help them as they process. The test isn't changed, but they're allowed more time in order to let their minds process between the two different languages. So you'll see that in the real world, there have probably been times when you've been differentiated for. So I hope that will build some empathy on your end. In your classroom or academic setting, you probably differentiate for all kinds of students all the time, whether it's for an IEP or a 504, or perhaps just for another student who maybe thinks differently, and you may need to find a way to, to reach them where they're at. When we talk about differentiation for ELLs, we're really talking about language differentiation, because that indeed is the issue that separates them from the, the rest of the students. Because what we want to do is ensure that the grade level content is still there, but it's comprehensible and it's challenging while still meeting the diverse language and learning needs of the ELL. 
we want to see this in two different categories differentiation of the support and the differentiation of scaffolding so if we look at support here we're talking about instructional strategies or tools that would aid in making the content comprehensible to the student and the other side is scaffolding here we want to build upon the students knowledge and acquired skills that they already possess to help them grow even further and to build that tower even higher so in our session today we're really going to be talking about the different ways of differentiation through methods of scaffolding and support so let's look again at the difference between these two types of differentiation when we talk about scaffolding we're talking about your intentional act of building upon a student's already acquired skills and knowledge to teach them the new skills this is per the WIDA resources guide and what we're seeing here is a real need for understanding a student and where they're at and what they can accomplish and what they can understand and using that to start there and build on it as we call on the ESOL world I plus one or using the zone of proximal development using Vygotsky's term and what we want to do is scaffold the language but we want to keep the cognitive demand and rigor very high because we do want to challenge students with things that will actually be meaningful and inspirational to them to learn and as we're doing that taking the scaffolds we're building upon we want to support them which is really using different instructional strategies and tools that will be used to assist students in assessing the content necessary for classroom understanding or communication and to help them construct the meaning from language so with the help of scaffolding and supporting we're really going to find a great model in differentiation. A model we really want to look at that I find very helpful in understanding the different responsibilities of both teacher and student is called the gradual release of responsibility model. And here we're going to start at the top and move down the page as we go. Usually in a lesson we start off with the teacher having more responsibility and providing a focused lesson. And here we call this the I do it section because you have a teacher with a lot of responsibility and students are there to be listening attentively and watching and seeing what the teacher is doing and following this we'll have some time for guided instruction where the teacher still is playing a very meaningful component in the process but now what's happening is the students are becoming involved this is the we do it section following that there's a collaborative section where the students begin to work together on a problem and that's the you do it together section or if I can contextualize and differentiate for southern people it's the y'all do it section and then finally we want students independently to be able to perform the tasks that require them to meet the standards that we have for our, our setting and this is the you do it alone category so at this point we see that the teacher has much less responsibility whereas the student has most of the responsibility upon their shoulders to complete the assignment or the task as required. So again, looking through the four different stages, it's I do, we do, y'all do, you do. This is a link to a great website on the teaching channel where a teacher is going to spend about five minutes showing us some ideas from a lesson that she performs with her students and also a lesson she works with some faculty on dealing with the gradual release of responsibility model. Uh, so please take a f about five minutes to watch this video and as you're watching it consider these questions how would using the I do we do y'all do you do model change the way that you plan your lessons and beyond shifting the cognitive load what are the benefits of structuring lessons in this way so pause the recording now to watch this video and then get back to this model alright well I hope that video is meaningful and as we look at this model of the gradual release, we're talking really about a mentoring relationship. And in a mentoring relationship, both people have roles and responsibilities, both the teacher and the student. So in each of the four categories of I do, we do, y'all do, you do, we see that the teacher and the students both have things that they need to be doing. I'm going to let you spend the time to look through this chart on your own, so feel free to pause the recording at this point to notice the different roles and responsibilities that both the teacher and the students are playing in each category and no, notice also how the students responsibilities become much greater as the lesson proceeds as we turn now to getting some really practical ideas about how to support our students in the classroom WIDA divides the different kinds of language supports into three categories sensory 
graphic, and interactive. So let's take a second to look at each of these, and then we'll talk about some examples from each category that might be helpful for you and your instruction. Well, in the sensory support category, we can bring in real live objects or manipulatives for students to handle. We can use pictures, photographs, illustrations, diagrams, and drawings, just visual representation. Or bring in things like magazines and newspapers if we're talking about it, a various topic where that might be something helpful for us. Physical activity using students' kinesthetic abilities is also a great idea. Or videos, films, broadcasts, and various other sorts of AV materials. And using models and figures are oftentimes very helpful for students to understand using their five senses more about what the things are that you're requiring them to do and to understand those issues. In the, term, in the category of graphic supports, you see things like charts, different kinds of graphic organizers and tables, graphs, timelines, and number lines are all great ways, usually on paper or up on your smart board, of ways to help students understand by seeing. The interactive supports are more interpersonal and inter interconnected sorts of things like having students working in pairs or partners or in groups of three or in small groups or in a whole group setting with the class or using some kind of cooperative group structuring and using things like the internet or software programs where they get to interact with something else besides just the teacher or just a student. It might actually even involve you using a little bit of uh, their native language to help out without using this too much as a crutch sometimes it is very helpful especially that first year to give students something to grab onto and it might even involve connecting them with a mentor outside the classroom to help them interact with someone that's really going to be able to support them and the specific needs that they have so going into the idea of the sensory supports again in a little bit more detail you'll see here a chart that includes supports that are related to each of the f four major categories that we might be teaching students in language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. So take a second to pause the recording to check out your specific section of instruction to learn some of the things that might be helpful for you. And you'll probably notice that you do some of these already, but that there might be a couple that you are maybe reminded of or things you might have never thought of that might be really helpful in your content area to be able to reach students where they're at using these sensory supports. Moving from sensory supports to graphic supports, you know as well as I that the world of the internet is full of different examples of graphic organizers, and you've probably had a lot of instruction in them in, in previous uh, settings, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to mention that um, the ELP standards with WIDA are actually made up of really only five standards. Along the top, number one, the social and instructional language of the school and classroom, number two, the language of ELA, number three, the language of math, number four, language of science, number five, the language of social studies. So in each one of these different standard strands, you're going to see that these different sorts of graphic organizers can be, be very helpful in providing students with a way, or you providing students with a way to show what they know graphically, or you presenting something in such a way graphically that really helps them to make connections using less text and more visuals to support them. Venn diagrams, T-charts, cycles, cause and effect charts, and semantic webs, which might even include our Frere model or the Four Corners vocab that we've done in the past, will be excellent ways of supporting students. So if there's a methodology to be able to differentiate effectively, you might see it as a four-step process. The first part of the process is to determine the student's current ability or what they can do. After that, we want to make sure that we understand very clearly what we expect them to accomplish. And knowing those two things, we'll be able to identify, thirdly, the gaps between their current ability linguistically and what is to be accomplished. And building off of that, the fourth step is to implement the strategies that will allow students to meet the expectations with what they can do. So providing them with sensory supports, like we've already talked about, providing with graphic supports like all the graphic organizers from the past slide or providing them instructional supports in groupings and pairings and the ways that they interact with the text different methods and modalities are all ways that we can help to differentiate for our students go back to the silly cartoon how can we challenge that monkey to climb even higher trees how can we get that fish to uh, perform the task that he needs to perform and all the other animals that were there we need to understand them know what they can do at the current time to move them on to where we need them 
to be by the end of the year or by the end of our course. So speaking of what students can do, I think it's an apt time just to review again the can-do descriptors. As you can see in the picture, they can be found in paper copy through your ESOL teacher um, by the different grade bands that are listed. And there's also a slide we'll look at next that describes all of them from pre-K to 12th grade all together on one big chart. What they really do is help us try to understand the students and their language abilities in each of the four language domains, speaking, writing, reading, listening, at the levels of their proficiency, levels one through five, and in the bands of their grade. They really just provide a sampling of language that a student can comprehend or produce in your classroom, and we can apply them to all of our WIDA standards, but they're really not seen as standards themselves. They're just benchmarks to help us understand students better. They can also be very helpful in helping us to plan lessons or observing student progress over time. So here's the can-do descriptor chart that includes all grade levels from pre-K to 12. At each of the five levels of English language proficiency running across the page, levels 1 through 5, and then running down the page, the four domains of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Let's just look at two boxes to give us an idea of what we see again here. And you can obviously pause the recording to look at it in more detail or find the paper copy as well. So let's choose writing as the domain and level two as the student's English proficiency level. At this level, we'd expect a student to be able to make lists and to produce drawings, phrases, or short sentences, and maybe some notes. And also, they should be able to give information requested from oral or written directions. So based on this, we're going to need to understand where our student is at so that they will be able to perform tasks at their level so we can move them up to in the future what a level 3 student can do and then a level student of level 4 and then a level 5. Again we don't want to change the cognitive demand of the students we want to change the language demands. We want to scaffold them and support them in such a way that we're helping them to accomplish the tasks just as meaningfully as other students just showing us different amounts of data. So, But by the time they get to a level 5 student, that bridging level where they're basically almost fluent, just like a regular English speaker ought to be. They can apply information to new contexts as they write. They can react to multiple genres and discourses. And they can author multiple forms and genres of writing. So we can obviously see the complexity of the task they can perform has developed from level 2 all the way to level 5. And once they get to level 5, they're really ready to perform at grade level. And they should be having about all the success that an average English speaking student should have. So when we get together in our face-to-face -face session we're going to discuss some issues about the gradual release model and how it meshes with can-do descriptors. So that'll be something to look forward to as we get together. And here's your individual assignment for for this module, module 3 on differentiation. We're assuming it'll take you about 45 minutes. It's called pick a level and you'll see the next slide has a description of the uh, task and also you'll find on the uh, module 3 site you'll see the link for this document as well so first of all think of one content area activity or objective that you have in working with a student and then using the candid descriptors from the previous slide record the English language proficiency level that a student needs to perform the task independently finally Use the three forms of language supports, going back to slide 11 if you need, to determine how that you would differentiate for that student in the task for one of the proficiency levels up and one proficiency level down. So the idea here is, once we set certain supports, we want to see how we could scale it up or scale it down. Because oftentimes a classroom is made of many students, where if we set one assignment, scaffold in a certain way, we might be able to up it a little bit or lower it a little bit to meet more students in our classroom at the same time. So that'll be your assignment. It's called Pick a Level and the next slide will show us more about it. So here's the Pick the Level chart that you can find here and as well as on the class website. And what you want to do is get your hands on the can-do descriptors, find out your student's level, and then use this chart and complete this chart. Um, the basic idea is if you choose an activity for a student you need to know what level the student is at to be able to know how to differentiate for them. And then once you've done that, you'll be able to um, show them how we can have you differentiated and how you can move a level up or a level down based on differentiation to meet the needs of other students as well. So this, the final small assignment 
for this differentiation module is an exit slip that you can send in with your pick a level chart. You can write it at the bottom or send it by email. Anyway, it's fine. We want you to identify at least one new strategy that you plan to incorporate into your classroom in order to better support your ELLs or your ESL students. Alright, so that's the end of module 3.